Hi, how are you? I'm okay, thank you. Well, I was going to say, I'm, I'm feeling, I'm feeling, um, sort of. This is sort of what I want to talk about, actually. I'm feeling slightly oh, great. disgusted by the human race after listening to that, <laughs> and 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 I have I have a theory I want to try out on you. It was great just listening and then going right. I'm going to be in that conversation now. Great. Um, uh, my theory is that these conversations tend to make one feel disgusted with being a member of human right of the human race, and that is not a good position to enact positive change from. And um, I feel like we can often start believing things. This is I'm trying to write a novel about this right now. So like you're going to help me for the next half hour, right? Perfect. Uh, Great. <laughs> I'm here for you. Excellent. Excellent. Good. Hi. <laughs> um, <laughs> so so yeah, it seems to me that we we end up sort of. I don't know, thinking about our urges and drives that we evolved to have and that have really made us an extremely successful species on the world stage um, as, as sort of inherently wrong and, and problematic. And um, I want to talk about my guinea pig. She is, uh, <laughs> you know. Please. Yeah, yeah. I have, I have a guinea pig. She's six and a half years old, which is old for a guinea pig. Um, and I, I adopted her about 18 months ago from a friend and the, the guinea pig, she loves to hide under a blanket. And that, you know, that's her natural drive, right? Her drive is towards being covered up and not being able to be seen while she eats some grass. That's what she likes. And I thought <laughs> the real problem with humans isn't that there's anything wrong with wanting to have more children and wanting to get food for your children and wanting to explore the planet and wanting to, be extremely good at, you know, occupying lots and lots of different ecological niches. The, the real problem is that we're just exceptionally good at it. Exceptionally good at um, changing the world to fit what we need. You know, if not Meg the guinea pig could uh, create the world as she wanted it, she would have a world covered in a blanket. And that would also be super, super bad <laughs> and would end up like destroying everything. Um, so I guess I don't know if but this of is a question. You, ha you 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 already have the like the sort of there's two problems in here. Yeah. One being uh, questions about human nature, right? There, I'm I tend to be deeply skeptical of stories about our essential natures, whether that mm -hmm. is a gendered essential nature or whether that is a sort of human nature, because- I'm in favor of so... skepticism, by the way, carry on. Great, <laughs> there, there are just far too many exceptions to start talking about what humans are and what humans do. We have a particular history of human activity on this planet, but we, ha we have an end of one. Right. This is what humans do, given the circumstances that humans have found themselves in on this particular timeline. Right. I mean, we are we are living the effects of colonialism and empire that have shaped human nature on this planet in profound ways. If that hadn't happened, let's say, you know, human nature might look very, very different. Um, oh, this is so a different I, question, though. I want to ask you this question as well. <laughs> now you're from my, I, I have, I'm not writing this book at the moment, but I have a book I want to write one day um, on the subject. What would the world be like if nobody had ever done murderous colonialism to anybody else? And I mean, you see, arguably better. <laughs> yeah, well, better. But like, here's my question. Would we recognize the people as people? Like, I, I'm really asking I, because I think it would be fun to write that book and I really want to know what it would be like if all we did was every time we traveled somewhere we just went oh well here I am and it's great to meet everybody and you know here's what I have to offer and here's you know what you guys have to offer and let's share and you know let's and obviously you know on an individual level people do that all the fucking time they told me that I was allowed to swear so I'm taking great it off. great yeah <laughs> um yeah I, I mean I think you're what you're saying now ties into the thing I was thinking about before as being the sort of second issue which is like the, the question of we right whenever you you start sort of like generalizing out that you know would quote unquote we are very very good at shaping the planet in our 
desired image and like my mind immediately goes oh no 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 this is like an an image that was decided upon by someone else <laughs> who who is like history we are continuing to unpack and currently this planet is being shaped by forces that are both profoundly complicated and you know powerful the, there are powerful forces that i don't think we would describe as we um, and so when you talk about what it is the planet look, looks like and how it is humans behave within the structures that we have built, I think it, you know, to my mind, it just like shatters into the, the multiplicities of, of human communities and ways of being and ways of being that have been suppressed given the systems that we've actually built. Um, so you're talking about um, we have certain norms in the west let's say about how you own a land is by settling it and doing agriculture on it and putting a fence around it rather than um how you own a land maybe by walking it and uh being involved or with how it about, or how about you it. don't even what if you don't own a land right right, right, right. what if what if we, we you know we had never come up with the idea that certain humans should have control over certain areas of you know physical geography and there was actually a commons that existed and pe and like that was the direction human history had taken you know who knows what human nature would be in that kind of a timeline well now you're talking in the in the in the <laughs> language of a, of a novelist here so so okay yeah. then um, so write that one <laughs> yeah no but let's talk about it what what would it look like like honestly mm -hmm. if we had i mean i guess like my I, I want you to tell me i'm wrong right my my sort of sad cynical i'm so depressed to be a human feeling which i would really like to first of all alleviate in myself and then alleviate in all my readers um my that's a great so, impulse that's you know I, I i try to do that um so so my sad feeling is oh but you see the logic of it man is that even if I and everybody in my community decides that we are going to share. All it takes is the one horrific bully who comes with weapons and other bullies. And then the logic of violence is that if you're not willing to do violence to others, but others are willing to do violence to you, eventually they will take over. But tell me how I'm wrong. So the thing that you're making me think about is actually the abolition movement, like prison and, and police abolition, right? Which I find an incredibly moving framework for a way to think about the world or a way to think about action in the world. Because of course the idea is not that you get rid of police and prisons and everything else stays the same. The idea is you need to change all of society such that prisons and police are no longer necessary, mm. right? And we do have examples of cultures and that are extant cultures in which, you know, people don't go to prisons for crimes. People, I was reading a, a piece in the New York Times that was a prison abolitionist interviewed a couple of years ago. Um, it was really great. And I can't remember uh, exactly what the piece was, but Google you should all go Google, Google that. that. Yeah, go Google that. Um, but she was talking very eloquently about speaking to a group of, of children. She was key, being she was a keynote uh, speaker at this conference, and there were a bunch of children that had been brought in to, to be, engage in this conference, and they sort of called her in before the conference started. Like someone came to her and was like, the kids want to talk to you. And she was like, okay. So she went in, and she, and she said she goes in, and they're all kind of standing there, arms akimbo, looking very, very skeptical. And they're like, we hear you want to get rid of prisons. And she's like, well, yes, I do, you know, and they're like, well, what do we do with the bad people? You know, what about the people who murder? What about the people who you know, like we need, you know, this is the like logical argument, right? We need somewhere to put them. And her response was to sort of, you know, point to Sweden or wherever it was where she was like, they don't have prisons because people don't murder each other. Right? They have created a social system in which not only are people not so desperate or so mentally ill that they, you know, are driven to such things. They have such an unviolent culture that the idea that the, the way to get what you want is to do violence to someone else is like not, it just like doesn't occur to you. If you're like, Wait, oh, I really you, want you, this thing, I should kill someone. <laughs> are, are, are you telling me that Scandinavian noir drama has been lying to me? <laughs> and in fact, there are no murders? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, I, yes, let's go with yes. Um, no, but it, it, but the idea that there could be a human society in which the threat of violence is not so omnipresent as it is in ours. And by ours, I mean sort of like Western, Northern hemisphere yeah, cultures. London. 
London, let's say London or New York, I'm speaking right. of New York. Um, I think that to, to disallow the possibility that that could even happen before you begin trying to imagine a more utopian vision of what a future could be like for humans is just sort of cutting yourself off at the knees before you try to figure out how to create the culture of care and how to create a society that like maybe really wouldn't need prisons or where you know you wouldn't be murdering each other over patches of land um and this is that this is the, the question going back to this question about human nature right that if you mm. if you accept that it is in human nature to want to do violence or to resort to violence or to feel violent urges um then then you are accepting you know either we're doomed or you are accepting an infinity of struggle. And my pessimistic self tends to actually believe more in the infinity of struggle. You know, I, I, I like, I kind of don't, I don't think we're gonna win, you know, right. but I think we have to keep fighting. Right. <laughs> um, but but I, I, I find it very like personally, emotionally very important to entertain the possibility that that everything could be different in ways that I'm not capable of imagining mm. or that I don't have enough sort of faith to be able to imagine. Have you read um, um, Ursula Le Guin's The Dispossessed? I have. I uh, love that book so right, much. Right. That seems like the yeah. best. Yeah. That seems like the best version I've seen of trying to imagine a society in which, and, and the way that you could be educated from a tiny child to they ha she has this brilliant thing where, where the, the, the mothers constantly say to that the child grabs a toy and says mine. And then the mother says, stop egoizing, stop egoizing. Mm -hmm. And that I can right. believe in. I, can, I can't believe in a culture. I can't believe in a humanity where a child never, ever has the urge to hit another child. I can sure. believe in a humanity where we've all gone, just as we have said, no stealing you know, and therefore we do not go into supermarkets and just take the food and go away with it. We go, we go and we pay for it. You know, money is a construct, right? Money is mm -hmm. a thing we made up, but we all act as if it's real. So I can believe in a world where we have all said, you know, no owning land or no owning animals or something like that. And <sighs> this is not imaginary also. I mean, I think Ursula Le Guin did a, a profoundly incredible job of imagining a a human society that that's almost impossible for us to imagine and making it feel very real and very possible um but there are in fact extant human societies that are very different from you know what you and i would consider normal so that i know that there are some first nations um indigenous groups in in sort of northern canada um i was reading a thing actually about parenting in one of these indigenous communities where it had to do with doing violence where when the child had the urge to do violence would like pick up a stone and like throw it at the mother the mother would pick up a stone and hand it to the child very calmly and say throw the stone at me and like it was this incredible way of parenting that I you know none of my friends certainly in New York City would imagine doing but it was a way of exactly what you're talking about managing the child's urge towards violence and training over time this kind of of calm that is just a sort of cultural calm that is that people don't as, as they you know age in that culture tend to feel as much of a propensity toward a violent response to things it get it gets you know mm -hmm. sort of taught taught away um and, and and i think there's great power in that and also potentially you know uh it can be very problematic as well, right? If, if you are then interacting with cultures whose response is to be violent, then that interaction probably isn't going to go very well. Right, um, I mean, I think that's, you know, I, I, have, I have almost no knowledge about archeology. span I did like one undergraduate module on archeology. span um, And, and uh, I was looking when I was doing it for um, information about cultures that had been very non-elitist so typically they'll say to you when you're doing archaeology they go you know what is a city a city is a big lot of settlements that has a set of elites so you can see elite dwellings you know larger properties whatever you know gold is found there rather than just stone whatever it is anyway uh, that's mixing up several different archaeological areas <laughs> um but uh, 
So there have been a few. Um, Mohenjo Daro in the Indus Valley had uh, really remarkably similar sizes of dwellings. Mm -hmm. And the only sort of large building was the temple where it doesn't seem like anybody lived, um, mm -hmm. which is, that's an interesting way of organizing things. Uh, but then we tend to find those cities that existed like that in ruins um, because the cities which were run by uh, some autocratic ruler who you did what he said or you would get beaten by his soldiers were the ones that could then come and attack the let's say more peaceful egalitarian cities I mean god knows I don't, nobody knows what life was like in in Mahendra I'm making it up um and I suppose that's what I mean when I look at the logic of it and I go, oh, all you need is one horrible, horrible city amongst mm. all of the beautiful cities. And it's just all screwed. Um, so I don't I don't have an I don't necessarily think we're going to sort that out in the next 14 minutes. But um, no, no, yeah. I don't. It does. It does sound like you're arguing very much for a, a certain kind of internationalism, though, that uh, seems to make a lot of sense. Say more about internationalism. Um, well, I mean, in a, in a very simple way that, you know, the sort of socialist project has always been that, you know, the idea that you can't have socialism in one country, right? That you sort of need to have socialism in all the countries because if the other countries aren't doing it, then it doesn't work. And um, we so far have seen that socialism in one country doesn't, doesn't always work and the other powers are messing about with things um so it's actually a good argument for something like socialism in all the countries <laughs> oh you have given me a good idea you've given me a good okay idea. will you will you tell me what novel you're actually working on and tell oh. me what the idea is and how it relates <laughs> well the novel i'm currently working on is ha ha i i've been working on it for two and a half years as a, as a novel set during a pandemic um so oh my yeah so it's gonna so that just a, got complicated yeah a bit of a rethink um it's a novel in which a bunch of tech billionaires flee from a global pandemic trying to get to their bunkers <laughs> in, new in, new in new zealand in new zealand <laughs> yeah uh, but they never make oh. it to new zealand they get stuck in the jungle um and you know it's it's kind of about how how well the values of the technology billionaires play in the mm jungle of Papua New Guinea um okay I haven't I haven't been to so Papua a tech New Guinea. a tech lord of the flies kind of there's 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 some more complicated stuff to it than that but I don't want to like reveal all of the um twists there is a big twist after that which I probably shouldn't have said that either but anyway <laughs> so uh, how does how does this current context change what you're doing I mean it obviously has is going to impact it somehow do, do you know yet I mean, interestingly, it involves thinking more long term, which is um, useful. Uh, so um, it seemed very clear to me that it, ca it can't be that the novel, which was going to be set sort of three years from now and, with, and, and currently starts with a lot of like, do you know what mm -hmm. happens in a pandemic style? Not exactly that, but you know what I mean? Like introduce right. To the all the things that most people didn't know like six months ago and now right. know that you don't right. have to explain yeah right what is an r number um mm -hmm. so all of that uh I'm, that, that cannot happen in the same way in three years from now so the novel is going to have to be about the next pandemic along which mm -hmm. um means that people remember this one as having been quite a kind pandemic because it doesn't take children yeah. And that I think we've all sort of taken that for granted as yeah. as just a fact of the situation. And it's we, we've sort of forgotten what an incredibly miraculous fact it is. Um, and I think the state of the world right now would be a great deal less hopeful um, than it is if we were in the midst of a pandemic that I mean, many do disproportionately take children. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's, it's dark, <laughs> but then, then I often do write dark. I want to ask you a question. Sure. I've, I've got a question in my mind. How do we come out of this pandemic better than we were before? I mean, in an ideal world, we have invested in green infrastructure for technologies that are going to 
revamp our economies and create a new workforce and, you know, sort of do the work of decarbonization. I mean, that would be, to me, a kind of ideal outcome. Um, we have precedent for this kind of thing, you know, nationalization of the railroads, you know, nationalization of... Did you know that the UK of, uh, nationalized its railroads at the start of this? I, I know, which just, you just, can do. Countries can yeah. do. <laughs> you can just tell choose you. that... Yeah, I'm going to tell yeah, you my ahead. most hopeful thought. This is my most hopeful thought about all of this. But I really want your hopeful thoughts as well, because just I feel like if we keep on thinking about ourselves as a terrible, awful species that has just destroyed the planet, we are not going to be able to do the work we need to do. Um, my hopeful thought is uh, I think the kids who've lived through this are going to be phenomenal. I think they are going to be kids who know mm -hmm. that you can make enormous change in 24 hours. You can, you know, you thought you had to go to school and you thought mom and dad had to go to work and you thought that, you know, you got your food from the supermarket and you thought that you could go around places not worrying about wearing a mask. You thought all these things and all those things changed just like one evening. And it could all be different. Right. It could all be different at any moment. It could right. all be different. Right. I have this like fantasy that in 15 years time, the kids who are like 12 now will be in charge of everything and we'll just go, OK, everybody scrap all of this. What we've been doing yeah. so far, scrap it. And we actually have some better ideas. Yeah. Everyone yeah. stay home for the next six months. And when you come out, we will have fixed it. Like, <laughs> just stay home. Do what you right. did. You remember what you did in the COVID. Just stay home. And when you come out, you will be uh, sharing one electric car between eight people and it will all be accessible via an app. Don't panic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everything's going to nice. be fine. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think my most hopeful thought about this is actually that the feeling that you're expressing, the feeling that humans are an awful pox upon this planet and that you in particular probably are... A, a, a terrible influence on your environment with the trash you throw out and the, the, you know, the bus you ride even, or the car you use the, the, this idea that we, that we, we just pollute just be by being alive. We are just these pollutant, awful creatures. This is a story that has been sold to you by the fossil fuel companies. Oh, good. BP is the company that invented, or rather not invented, plucked out of academic obscurity, but popularized the idea of the carbon footprint. And this idea I think has gotten so deeply embedded in our sense of who we are and our sense of what is possible and particularly our sense of who is responsible for the place that we are right now, that I think it's, it's just, it's a pernicious mythology that I think we need to get outside of. And, and my hope would be that we could get beyond this idea, you know, which is not to say that people are not you know, individually responsible in various ways and that the choices we make, you know, I don't wanna say the choices we make don't matter, but I think it's very, very important to refocus our attention on the structures that exist currently and particularly fossil fuel companies and the work that they have done to make us believe that we are the problem and that we have to change. And it isn't, it isn't them that needs to change. It isn't the structures that need to change. Those things are fine, but we need to be smaller. We all need to individually chip in, you know, World War II style and shrink our carbon footprints and just, you know, really buckle down and, and be smaller on this planet while people continue to make billions and billions and billions of dollars off of these structures and these industries that are the things that are making us sort of shrivel in our souls and, and sort of feel this, this self-loathing. I think it's very important to redirect that loathing and redirect that rage towards the responsible parties. And I think that's fossil fuel companies. I think that's, you know, politicians. I think that that's, we forget that, that we live inside structures we have built and that we can change those structures. You know, kind of like you were saying with the kids, like, I think that's a great insight that, that kids are going to live in a world where they understand that what is, seems fixed is not so and could be changed. Mm. That seems to me like an incredibly powerful place to start from. And then sort of couple that with the idea that like, like me personally is not the problem. Actually, it's the structures that are the problem. And so let's, you know, put our energy towards changing those things. That, that seems like a good outcome.
yeah no that is that is absolutely brilliant um and also surprisingly helpful for my novel so uh i feel I'm so glad <laughs> pleased for the people who have they, they like put put us together here because yeah um i mean i i say all of this and this is my like like passionate utopian heart speaking <laughs> um but i also have to say nothing in the current trajectory suggests to me that this is the direction we're headed right that yeah. that the trillions of dollars of you know bailout that have happened for covid have not in fact gone towards creating a new uh like a, a green new deal or creating some kind of workforce in the us that could jump in and start creating the infrastructure for technologies that would decarbonize our economy you know that would be great but we are in fact going in the opposite direction. Fossil fuel companies have gotten huge bailouts. You know, people are out of work. The economy is crashing. There is no end in sight. Our government is lying to us. We're moving very quickly into a liberalism where you have government appointees sort of, you know, going against the word of the scientists and researchers who say what is actually happening with the science and sort of changing what's on the official White House government websites. I mean, like, like crazy, crazy things are happening. And and at the same time, we're seeing like a new chapter in a civil rights movement in our country, right? And so both of these things can exist at the same time. And I sort of take hope from that, that while I'm looking at the larger structures not changing, um, I'm looking at an energized youth and at an mm. energized, you know, an energized population in a way here that I've, I've never seen in my lifetime, so, you know, being willing to protest in the streets and being willing to, to say, this is not right um i want to tell you a thing from from the jewish tradition which i find very helpful when i think about these things um there's a there's a jewish saying which goes uh, in hebrew it's la lecha ham lecha ligmor, which means um, it's not up to you to finish the work but neither are you free to refrain from it and that seems like a very good uh mind state for an activist that's that's certainly the attitude that I take to a lot of these things. You know, I've been handed from previous generations some problems and some problems that have been solved. I mean, the problem of trying to get education for women was solved before I turned up. And so when I for arrived, some. was solved, for me. solved for some. Right. Yeah, for you. Yeah, for me. Yeah, um, that that problem in in a middle class family in London, that problem had been solved. So yes, it exists in other places. And it's my job to try to hand it on a little bit better than it was handed to me. And it's not up to me to reach the far shore. It's and I and not to expect to reach the far shore. But it yeah. is up to me. It's, I, therefore, it's not I'm also not allowed to go well, it's all screwed. So I'm off. I think about that thinking of ourselves not as like, you know, the heroes in some, you know, activist narrative, but uh, but really thinking of ourselves as ancestors, right? Mm. That that what we we do now is going to be we're going to create the things that the people who come after us are working with, right? And so to leave the best set of tools, whether those are ideas or community networks or technologies or you know whatever those things are that people are creating now that they're they're good at creating and, and thinking of yourself as as already an ancestor mm. I, I think is is a kind of useful for me at least kind of reframing of what what my work or responsibility or you know life can be about yeah I know I think that's I think that's absolutely right um and that's one of the obviously huge benefits of a bit of long-term thinking. Also in the long-term, we can look at human history and say, oh, we have, <laughs> we have gone down some blind alleys regarding consumption, <laughs> but uh, also we've made some amazing things, you know, also we've yeah. created and discovered and learned and grown and, you know, like the things that we know about now that people didn't know about a thousand years ago. It's, it's, I, I, I feel like it's worth um, celebrating, enjoying. It's, it's so much easier, at least for me, to, to see the darkness. Mm. Um, and I find that I have to actively work 
to to push myself towards seeing the wonder and 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 the lightness and the the joy in what we have built and what is pot potentially to come and I feel like that is an active work that mm. that like I and people I know have to keep doing particularly people who work on climate issues it is very fucking easy to see the darkness there and you you have to like keep course correcting toward the light to keep going <laughs> well that, that's that's what I'm gonna try and do that's what I'm gonna try right.